Turn to your first, uh, first Samuel chapter 17. How many of you know what's in first Ch- Samuel chapter 17? What somebody say it? David and Goliath? Uh-huh. That's right. So what are we going to be talking about tonight? Well, you know, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man those things that God has planned for them that love him. I know they've got some people that love the Lord around here. Amen? And, uh, and David was one of those guys. He was a, a, a lover of the Lord. He spent plenty of time with the Lord. And so tonight we're going to draw from his message some things that up until that point had never been seen before. How many of you know when things have never been seen before, it makes people afraid? It makes people leery about trusting God. And, and all of a sudden they find themselves right in the midst of a challenge, a temptation that's going to really try to define their faith. And, and this is what we're going to learn from David is what to do when those times come. So I want to call tonight something kind of specific called stay, uh, stay, stay your distance, keep your distance. Everybody say keep your distance. I want to kind of look at, at this this account of David and um, kind of learn. David was a warrior. Uh, I'd like to call myself a warrior, you know, not against man, but against the enemy, the darkness, man, those that, those things that come to steal, kill, and destroy, those things that show up when you least expect them, those, those things that happen in life, and, and uh, they'll try to define them with these moments that happen. And, and so we, we're, we're going towards our 2017 vision, which is eyes have not seen. And in order to do that, uh, the, the, the pastoral mantle job, duty, responsibility, whatever you want to call it, is to equip the saints. If you're not ready for victory, you're not going to have it. If you don't know what to do in the midst of a trial, you'll probably go down swinging. Most of the times, we think that what we have to do is go hand-to-hand with the devil. And I hear people talking about all the time about the devil, the devil, the devil. Well, David found himself in a situation. It was kind of thrust upon him unexpectedly. How many of you ever had things happen unexpectedly? How many of you have ever walked into a a friend, a a co-worker, a a family member, and they're in a great battle, and and they they just hoping that someone will come in and know what to do? Now, in the midst of that, you know, everybody's going to benefit from it. We've been saying that a lot lately. You know, our miracles are never just about us. Our victories are never just about us. Our walk with God is always involving someone else. And, and guess what? People need to see that. People need to see some, some really sustained victory. We don't, we don't need to see any more defeats. Amen? So in, in chapter 17... Let's pray first. Father, we just ask you to extract out of this word tonight that which is going to be helpful. It's going to equip. It's going to prepare us to do the work of the ministry and to build the body of Christ. Not to stay stagnant or static, but Father God, to build the body. Father, we trust you with that. We, We know that you've given us the Lord Jesus Christ to build the church. And Lord, we need that wisdom and that understanding. We ask you right now to give us a spirit of wisdom by revealing to us the knowledge of his will. And the eyes of our understanding can be opened and that we'll know the hope of your calling and that we won't resist that, Father. Why we're here, Lord, to glorify you and to bring forth the inheritance that you have put in all of us that sometimes we don't even realize the magnitude of it. Help us to understand that, Father. And to experience the exceeding greatness of your power as we sing the praises of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, it starts out, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It's long, but it starts out that this battle has been set. And and so the the Israel-Israeli army for 40 days has been listening to this big guy, Goliath. And he comes out and he is continually blaspheming God. He's just looking for a man. He's looking for somebody. Send me somebody that'll come out and fight with me. Just send me one man. I mean, how many of you know the devil gets bolder when we don't respond? The more boldness he has and the less response we have, you understand, the, the, the more that everybody's going to kind of accept defeat. Israel had done that. They had their whole army out there 
under the guidance of Saul, and he's in his tent, and the army's out there, and, and I don't know whether they were one by one or troop by troop or company by company, they were retreating. But when David comes on the scene, you know, he was there at his father's, and he was out tending the sheep and the flock, and, and he had been trying some things. You know, there, there was a lion that came up and tried to steal the sheep. There was a bear that came up and tried to steal the sheep. And, and you know, all of those are type and shadowed, right? You know, you can put names on them, uh, and, and, and there are some people that are lions that are stealing sheep, and there are some people that are, <laughs> come on now, bears that are stealing sheep. The, so that you understand, this is not just talking, this is type and shadow. We, we have to understand there's always something after God's people, which are called sheep. And so Jesus came to prove to us that there's no weapon formed against you can prosper. Why? Because that was an Old Testament scripture. And so he went up against every foe. He went up against disease. He went up against sickness. He went up against division. He went up against, you know, the thief, the steal, the kill, and destroy. He went up against all of these things. And we see the accounts of them time and time again. He taught us parables that would relate to things like we're seeing here. And, and boy, the enemy was just relentless. I mean, the more he went, man, 40 days he was out there breathing out threatenings. In verse 8, we pick up on this narrative where in verse 8 he comes into this place and he begins to say, and he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said to them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and you servants to Saul? Choose a man for you and let him come down to me. Verse 9, if he is able to fight with me and to kill me, I will be your servant. But if I prevail against that one, him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Now, the first thing I found wrong about that, how many of you know we don't serve man? He had that accurate. He said, you're servant to Saul, which really defines to us why they're afraid. You see, when we put our trust in man, this is the correlation that David did not, he didn't associate with. He was not trusting in man. I mean, if he was, then he would have joined the ranks of those who were hidden in the hills. You see, Saul was just a man that was given a responsibility by God that he was failing miserably because he, he didn't have the anointing, right? So Israel had chosen him, and here they are up against this battle, one man, one giant, and so David was sent by his father after 40 days to bring victuals or bring food to his brothers who were also in that part of the army. And he arrives there and he finds himself surprised that Israel is hiding. They're hiding. And, and David was such a covenant-minded person and a servant of the Most High God that he didn't understand this. You know, we, we tend to understand the, the logic of things instead of the word of things. We tend to understand you know, well, hey, that's, that's big stuff. Come on now, that's a mountain of a problem. How many of you with me now? See, we, we tend to see things like that, and, and I find in my own self that there's times when you walk into a person's arena in their situation, and they're in full-on battle array with the enemy, and they're retreating. Now, you understand, you get further and further in unbelief the more you hang around unbelief. You understand? The more you hang around the, the, the acceptance of, you know, what it looks like and all that stuff, the more you're going to find that there's going to be more people on that side than the other. But here comes David, a little old guy, a little ruddy, red-headed teenager. And, and so he comes into this thing, and, and he's, he's had some victories. He's trusted God. He's, he killed the lion. He killed the bear, and he's about to tell Saul all that. And, man, he is just, he is just perplexed that this is going on. Now, one thing David knew was what, who he was serving. Saul might have been king, but he had a God. And everybody claimed to know, but he knew his God. He had proven his God. He knew his weapons. He knew all he needed. And we're about to see that play out in a minute because I'm going to read the rest of that story when I get to that point. I had, a, I had a, an interesting comment the other day that was made in and I just want to share it with you. It was in a meeting, and it was with a person, and this person 
was, was very compromised. And, and everybody knows it that knows them. And they said to me, I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I'm just, this is who I am. This is what I am. I said, well, hold on a second. I said, do you call yourself a Christian? Yes, I do. I, and they give me their pedigree, how long they've been saved and where they were at. And I said, but you call yourself a Christian. That means that you have Christ in you. You should care about what people think about him. I said, this is, this is the problem with modern day Christianity. It's all about me when really what David knew was it's all about him. This is not about my honor. I'm going to put myself out there for the one I serve. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. If I've got to stand alone in this, it doesn't matter how many have retreated, but I'm going to believe God. This is what David said. I know what's in here. I don't know the outcome of the battle. I don't know what's about to happen. I don't know if he's going to take my head off. I don't know if I'm going to live to see another day. I don't know what the future holds, but what I do know is my God. Now, this is what set David apart from however many thousands of men that were retreated in the hills. One man, one God. Come on now. And so David comes into this situation. We're going to drop down now. As I told this person, I said, I said, you should worry about what people think about you when you're a Christian because you represent the Most High God. That very name, Christian, identifies you with a mighty, mighty God. And I may not be mature enough in my current status and situation where I can face a big mountain, but I know my God can. I know I've got at least a mustard seed of faith on the inside of me that there is nothing can harm him, that there is nothing that can overcome or overturn him. And and I've got to trust that, amen? I know what the word says. Come on now. So did they. They were the covenant army of God. And one man breathing out threatenings. You just heard it. Send me one man. Send me one. His army is sitting back there spectating, and God's army is over there hiding. One man. It's amazing to me. Everybody said, keep your distance. So what did David do? We're going to drop down now to the next few verses, starting in verse 39. And we're going to kind of read from there right on through the end of that, at least to, I think, verse 51. And David is, he, he's trying to find this, is there a cause for this? What's going on? What's happening here? And, and man, and he begins to go now into Saul's company and, and Saul says, man, you, you're, just, you're just a little old kid, man. And he said, wait a minute, I've, I've done some things in the Lord's service. I have, there was a lion that tried to get his sheep and I slew him and there was a bear that came and I slew him and, and Saul says, man, but, I, but you know, you have to understand this thing is insurmountable. It's a bad thing when leaders begin to fold on you. It's a bad thing when leaders don't know how to lead their people in the victory. It's a bad time when, when leaders begin to compromise how big God is. That deserved a big amen. You're not going to hear that around here. I don't know what's going on, but I tell you this, my God's a big God. I'm telling you, he's bigger than any devil you've ever heard of, so I don't really want to talk about him. But Goliath is a type of the dark side, the evil side, the, the side that's against God. He's an enemy, right? And, and David began to relate his past experience and, and things that he had done, and, and he did that all with a little sling and some rocks. And so Saul begins to encourage him. <laughs> and, and he tells him, look, he said, I want you to put on my armor. Put, him, put it on, put it on, mount up. And so they girded his sword upon him, and he put himself in a state to go, and for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these. Now, I've got a point here. I've not proved them. And David put them off of himself, and that's in verse 39. Now, my question is, we have to learn to prove the Lord in the little things. We're not running in there trying to go head on and to to fight these big giants and not proving anything. I mean, all I've got is a little doctrine. I haven't proven it yet. How many of you have ever proven your doctrine? You know, if if you believe it, then stand up for it. Don't run into the battle half-cocked and try to see if it works. I mean, David here, he said, you know, I'm going to take this stuff and put it off. And he took his staff in his hand, verse 40, and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook. 
And he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script, and in a sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. And now, as, as he is doing this, he had already taken off. I, I, you know, how many of you know part of our armor is the sword of the Spirit? But you got five other pieces. Truth, righteousness, peace. You know, there's so many today that just simply, they've got this education, but they have no revelation. They have nothing to really back it up. I mean, I'm just going to try it out and see if it works. Man, you just didn't go in with a butter knife. Come on now. The enemy's not afraid of people that don't know how to use their weapons. And he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones out of the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag, and he had in a script, and he taken a sling in his hand, and he drew near. He's going now to do battle. Verse 41. Let's keep going. The Philistine came out and drew near to David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. That's how big his shield was. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, and it disdained him, and he said, you're a youth, ruddy, fair countenance. Yeah, how many of you ever know that the devil always tries to size you up? You ever notice that? The moment a symptom happens, the moment a situation occurs, he tries to size you up just like that. Anybody ever know what I'm talking about? I mean, immediately you're going to start hearing him size you up. You know, he even did that to Jesus. Throw yourself off of the temple. Doesn't the word say? Jesus said, let me tell you what the word says again. Come on now. He knew how to use the sword. He knew how to use his weapon. Jesus gave an illustration right there. Don't let the enemy just lure you into a fight with your doctrine. Right. Amen. I must be, y'all must not be hearing me. I don't know. Y'all, y'all know this already, right? That must be what it is. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Everybody say, keep your distance. <laughs> Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. How many of you know that's enough? You don't need more than that. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have embarrassed. This day, when is faith? One day God's going to do something. God's going to heal me. God's going to restore. God's going to. God's going to. God's going to. David said, it's over today. You mean, Pastor, we can have that kind of, you better. You understand, God gave us dominion. This is dominion speaking. This is not not hope that the enemy's going to get scared. He knew the enemy wasn't going to get scared. The enemy already sized him up, said, I got him. And that's what the enemy does to you. He sizes you up, and the moment you start whiny, 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 you're sized up. You ain't got a chance. David said, I'm all in, man. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you. Take your head from thee, and I will give your carcasses. Notice carcasses David just challenged the whole army wait a minute I I wonder why David could say in the Psalm 91 a thousand may fall at one side and ten thousand in my right hand but where do you think David got that kind of attitude his God was bigger than his enemies His God was bigger than the potential of how bad it could be. His God was bigger than what the doctor said, the lawyer said. His God was bigger than what man had to say. His God went beyond and above and beyond that. You you don't get this. Never mind. Your carcasses, all of you, the host of the Philistines, this day to the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the earth and all the earth may know What am I called to do? What am I called to be a Christian for? To go to church? Come on now. Or to show the lost that there is a God. That there is one you can't see that will do what he said he'd do. David trusted that. 
This day all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. I want the earth, I want, I want the world to know there's a God in the church. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with a sword and a spear for the battle is to the Lord's. He will give you into our hands. Wait a minute. Did you notice that? And the Lord will give you, not in my hand. Are y'all getting that? You, do you understand that, that it just takes somebody to stand up for everybody? Come on now. And, and we all get to enjoy the victory. Come on now. Are you getting this dominion thing? Just take somebody. And, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came to nigh to David, that David hasted and ran toward the enemy to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it. Slang it. Everybody say slang it. Come on now, that's good, man. He slang it. I mean, he, he wasn't just taking target practice. Man. He slang it. I mean, come on now, when you slang it, man. I've seen pitchers throw curveballs, and then I've seen pitchers slang it. And that batter just didn't go, whoa, what was that? I, in fact, that reminds me. How many of y'all ever heard of a guy? Can I just tell you a little story real quick? I think it's funny because this guy was slanging it. And, and uh, you know, he was a pitcher at LSU, and his name was Ben. Maybe, maybe huh? Yeah, and, and so Big Ben, man, he was pitching for the Orioles, and I was in there playing softball. And I was Skip Burton's batting cage trying to figure out how to hit this thing like Bill Boyette can. And I never achieved that, by the way, but that's another story. And Big Ben comes in, and he's got all of his Oreo stuff on, and I got my little bat in my hand, and I'm hitting the ball, and they're looking at each other, and I'm the only one in there, and we just kind of made eye contact. I realized who it was, and I was impressed, you know. And so his catcher, he takes his catcher's bag and he sets it down on the floor and, and he begins to put on his shin guards and he begins to put on everything, his, all, all the paraphernalia to protect himself and his, and his mask and he gets down and then Ben starts, you know, just warming up. They got a pitcher's mound kind of out of plastic and it's measured 65 and a half feet, whatever, and, and he's, just, he's just kind of throwing it. And then he started slanging it. And, and I had never seen a major league pitcher before, you know. And so, man, I just kind of took my bat and put it down. I walked over there, and I, I'm talking to the catcher, and I'm just standing there like this. And I said, man, that, oh, man, man, he's, he's doing pretty good. He said, yeah. And he said, you ever seen a major league pitcher up close? I said, no, never have. He said, he said well, look, don't get a bat, but just stand in here like you're a hitter. And, and I said, man, really? He said, yeah. So I got in there like, you know, where you think it's in that box right there, and I'm, I'm getting in there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I played baseball when I was younger. And this big old boy unfolded, and he threw one, and it was obviously a fastball, and it looked like it was the size of a pea. And when he let it go, it looked like he's so tall, it looked like he let it go right here in front of my face. And I went, wow. I'm like, whoa. I said, man, he's slanging. it. He threw as hard as he could. He said, oh, no, that ain't as hard as he could. He said, step in here again. I said, this time I backed up a little bit. <laughs> you know, he is human. <laughs> Just in case he happens to release it the wrong direction. Because he's slanging it, man. And, boy, all of a sudden, man, he comes in to, boy, he's slanging another one. And I was impressed. And he's slanging another one. And then he said, you want to see his curveball? And I said, I don't know. Because <laughs> he's right-handed. And, I mean, that curve is going to come this way first. And in case it don't grab enough air inside this building, it might hit me in the side of the head. He said, he ain't going to hit you. I said, man, I, I'm not truly convinced. He said, step in the box. I said, I'm in. Man, when he let go of that thing, I jumped back out of the way. That ball was coming. I thought surely it was going to hit me, and it drove right in there, and they started laughing because he was slanging it. David slanged it. And it smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Now remember that verse. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine, slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran, stood upon the Philistine, took his sword 
drew it out of the sheath and slew him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, everybody say the next two words. How do you deal with the devil? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's a great doctrine. But what, what does he really flee from? What really puts the enemy in high gear away from you? What really? See, you keep your distance. David didn't cross over the brook to fight the Philistine. David had already been to the brook, took the five stone, went to the edge of it. And I've been there in 2009 on my second trip to Israel with Brian Zond and his group. Me and you both went. And, and the distance where that valley took place, which is only one it could be, was one, this one place, and it was historically correct. It was probably about 100 yards or more. Now, how many of you know that when you take a little stone, maybe the size of a golf ball, and you put it in a sling and slang it, I don't care how hard you slang it, the velocity cannot penetrate the forehead of a tall, big giant without something supernatural behind it. Now, the, 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 the type and shadow of a rock is revelation. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He's talking about what you know about me is a rock. And he'll give you the revelation necessary for you to face your enemy and keep your distance and just simply, when he can say word, you've got something to shout back at him this day. You're about to find out how big my God is. Are you listening? Everybody say, keep your distance. I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to give you three things here real quick. The first thing, you don't take this personal when you're under some kind of an attack. Amen? Don't take it personal. Because it's really not about you. The enemy is challenging the God. You say that I am a Christian because of him. And when we say Christ is in me, you understand, he don't believe it. He is the ultimate unbeliever. He is the ultimate that wants to challenge the very fact because he feels like if he sizes you up, he'll get you down for the count. David knew how to keep his distance. David wasn't one of these bravado guys going to launch out there with his polished up doctrine and just go hand to hand. He said, no, no, I've been trained. Now, watch through a few scriptures with me. The first thing I want you to see is how to stand your ground. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I want you to take these couple of notes and we'll close out. Brother Jamie, you can actually come on back up here. It ain't going to take long. Everybody say, stand your ground. David stood his ground. He knew that he was on the right side. He knew that he was on God's side. He knew that the dividing line. You understand? He knew why the devil, why Goliath kept saying, Come to me. Come over here on my term. Come here on my knowledge. Come over here and listen to what I have to say. Come over here and stand on my turf. You better learn how to keep your distance. You better learn how to stay in place and where God puts you. You... Finally, my brethren, Paul said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Go ahead. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the strategies of the devil. There's a playing out the scene. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand. Do you know how to stand your ground? I didn't say stand your doctrine. Do you know how to stand on the side with God? Do you know how to stand and plant your feet on the rock? I know y'all don't like movies. Y'all gonna think I'm a heathen. I like movies. I like Karate Kid. Part one. Miyagi was my hero. Why? Because Miyagi... Knew how to fight. Karate Kid wanted to learn how to fight. He said, why do you want to learn how to fight? He said, so I can defend myself. And he wouldn't say anything to him. After being under his teaching and training for a little while, Miyagi said, why do you want to learn how to fight? He said, so I don't have to fight. 
It's time for the church to learn that one. Get the wisdom of Miyagi-Do. We train so we don't have to fight. We train so we know where to stand and what to do when the enemy starts breathing out threatening. We know that what we don't have to do is go hand-to-hand combat to prove ourselves to the devil because we're going to stand on the side with God and let God prove Jesus to him. Let him prove him once again that he knows how to deal with cancer. He knows how to deal with heart disease. He knows how to deal with separation. He knows how to deal with financial difficulty. He knows how to deal with do I need to go on. Do you know how to stand not in your doctrine but in the truth? Come on now. Do you know how to make a stand in a battle? Keep your distance. Look at somebody and tell them, keep your distance. Understand, I see too many just, they come back bruised and battered. They look like the sons of Sceva. They're unclothed spiritually. They've got their head tucked between their legs. I mean, I loved it. You know, <laughs> never mind. I'm, I'm, that's another movie. I'm not telling you that one. Y'all be for sure. You're going to go tell everybody, man. You don't negotiate with the devil, you stand. David made a stand, and when the devil tried to negotiate, he said, no, let me tell you what's going to happen. When's the last time you told the devil it's written? When's the last time you faced a situation? Listen, have you faced a lion and the bear? Have you got rid of a headache? Have you got rid of a, of a little ailment of some kind? Have you got rid of that? If you ain't got rid of that, then when it comes time for something bigger, you ain't ready. Come on, if the word doesn't work against the little things, it's surely not going to work against the big ones. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, I, look, Pastor, I don't want to pray about that. I might need something bigger later. I'm like, what? Hey, you know what he got? Because I prayed for him. He got nothing. Come on now. We, you know, we're, we're Christian. We're supposed to be trained and know, but, man, we're not training with the little things. We're waiting on the big things, man. No, no. You better learn how to fight the lion and the bear. The second thing is speak faith towards your enemy. Mark 11, 22 to 24. They had cursed the fig tree and he had cursed the, in front of the disciples and the fig tree withered the next day. And Jesus said to them, have the faith of God. For I'm telling you that verily means truly. For truly, I'm telling you, whosoever would say, Unto this mountain, a type and a shadow of a big problem. If you would say, be removed and cast into the sea and not doubt in his heart, there's a key. It doesn't matter what you say. It matters about how your heart is when you say it. Now, God knows whether you're speaking it from faith or from fear. Whether you're speaking it from someone who has dominion or who has doctrine. How many of you understand doctrine doesn't give you dominion? Faith does. All right. And shall not doubt in his heart where faith is, but shall believe that those things which he is saying shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, is that a promise? Is that a guarantee? If you doubt not. Doesn't matter how big the mountain is. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them. And Jesus' words, now he said, you're going to have them. Shall have, you know, he said it might take 30 minutes, it might take an hour, it might take a day or two. But during that time, you've got to stand. And you've got to speak to the mountain. And you've got to undo what the enemy is putting in your head about how big he is and trying to negotiate, come over here and fight me. Come over here, if you kill me, we'll all serve you. David said, you're going to serve me anyway. In fact, if you hang around, you're going to get your head lopped off too. You understand, what are we trying to teach our church? Before we're going to have eyes that see things you've never seen before, you've got to get trained. Start working on the little things because Jesus gave that promise. And so you begin to speak toward the enemy. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how big it is. You size it up. How do I size it up? Compare it to God. One of the first series that I'm going to teach in the up and coming year, 2017, I'm really just winding up getting ready for that. It's going to be Big God and God Big. What's the difference? Everybody believes in a big God. But not too many people have seen God big. 
bigger than their enemy, bigger than their problem, bigger than that. They have gotten so consumed in their circumstances that they forget how big God is and what he's doing while they're standing and saying. Watch. The last thing I want to tell you. You got to release that revelation, man. The word coming out of your mouth, it is written. It's got to be this day. It can't be God's going to. It's got to be I'm making a stand for Jesus right now. And he said, in my name, you shall cast out devils, speak with new tongues. You shall take up serpents, drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt you. He meant every word of it. And he said, and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The problem with the sick and they don't recover is because they don't believe anything. And it takes God's will. You understand, God is sovereign over his gifts. He can manifest them anytime he wants to, but he needs people to believe him. You understand? It doesn't matter how much Christ and power I have on the inside of me. You understand? He couldn't do mighty works because of their unbelief, and neither can we. So what do we do? We come to church, and we get rid of the unbelief, and we start getting excited about what God's doing. We don't, do, we don't sit there like a totem pole. Come on now, I'm telling you, man, this is real stuff. This is not a fantasy story that we read about David. This happened. How many believe it happened? Well, learn from what he did, man. He prepared himself. He was ready. He got the five smooth stones. Oh, we get real thick like, well, they knew Goliath had five, five, four brothers. Who cares? He said, all of y'all going down. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with a key statement here in a minute. But you've got to know this day, man, it is written. You've got to start the moment the enemy, I mean, when you feel a twinge of something change, you feel a, a, a pain, you feel a, a, a thought, you feel something, you better be right now. Because you're going to walk like David sometimes in an unsuspected thing, and they, everybody else is going to tell you about the other side and how they lost. I'm going to stand. I've had to do it, and it's pretty scary sometimes. <laughs> it's not real scary. Not even real hard. Keep your distance. Everybody say, keep your distance. David had went into battle with what he had proved. Start proving God in the little things. Come on now. Start proving God in things that <laughs> are little. And I'm not talking, then, then, now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, okay, God, take away this or God, do this. No, dominion says this day. This day, I'm standing up for God. Not like that person told me, I don't care what people think about me. I really don't care what they think about me either, but I, I care what they think about who I represent. I'm going to call myself a Christian, but I want to do good about representing him, amen? And that's, that's one thing that you don't see much today. Leaders are folding. Come on now, we're not afraid to say Jesus and we're not afraid to say You know why? Because that's something on the inside of me they can't take. That's something the devil wants to try to intimidate and say, well, that doesn't happen anymore. Well, you're too late, bub. Come on now. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is dwelling in me and I'm going to, listen, I've had people say, well, pr pray in tongues. Let me hear you. I'm like, no. I don't have to prove nothing to you. It's not what it's about. It's not about me you know, no. So you can humiliate and go, you know, blaspheme God and probably die because of it. <laughs> Prove your doctrine. Prove your word before you need it. Train so you don't have to fight. Didn't he say the battle is the Lord's? Wait a minute. Wait. Let's, let's, let's see if we understood. Whose battle is it? Uh, it, it wasn't David's battle. Did he say that? The battle is the Lord. So he wasn't David against the whole army. <laughs> it was David against a giant. So in closing, it says, when the other side saw what happened this day, why did the Philistines flee? Why does the devil flee? flee from you I resist him well 30 seconds ago then your countenance started showing that he's now getting through See, this is where the battle's at it's words man it, it's challenge come over here I dare you 
Let me give you a tree of knowledge about how many tried what you're trying and they failed. A thousand fall at my side, ten thousand my right hand, but me, I'm going to stand. Are you with me now? Come over here. I, you know, I'm going to keep my distance because you don't belong where I am. Some people get out from under that covering and they go out there and play in the world a little while and they want to come back in and like Brother Charlie says, sprinkle a little pixie dust on them and win the battle. No, no. You untrained. You better watch out. Brother Charlie, y'all didn't send soldiers into battle that they, they signed up yesterday and took off today, did they? Trained them, huh? In the natural, we do that. But in the spiritual, I've been in church six weeks. I'm ready to preach. Yeah. I remember those days. Come on now. Then I didn't want to preach no more. I had the devil sitting right over, not where you are, brother, not you. <laughs> right behind you. Why did the Philistines flee? Everybody stand up on your feet. We're leaving. Why did the whole army flee? I want you to think about it because you probably got, you all all got different answers of why, and that's your theology. Speaking out, man, I know why, I know why, I know why, I know why, I know why. Well, back up. David prepared himself, got his five smooth stones. And you know what? If it was for Goliath's brothers, okay. You know, so what? But the whole army left. Not just the four brothers. Everybody. Why does the devil back off from you when you know how to fight? Why does the devil... How many of you would, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, man, Brother Phil, it, it's in Revelation when it says, and shut the devil up for a thousand years. I, that would be so nice to shut him up for a while, don't you think? But you know what? That day hadn't come yet. He's still blabbing. Thing is, do you know how to slang it? The Philistines fled because of the supernatural manifestation of God because where David was and where Goliath was it was physically not possible to slang a stone and hit a giant in the forehead with such velocity that it penetrated his thick skull and the devil's got a thick skull if he's got one come on now it's physically not possible. When the devil sees signs and wonders that only God can do, he ain't hanging around for part two. You said amen. You kind of shook your head. You kind of, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm really, if I'm making any headway here or not. <laughs> I, you don't have to amen or anything, but... I don't want you to just take a doctrine or something I'm preaching and go out there and try to make it work. This is something that takes some training. This is something that takes some doing. You don't do this overnight. You don't. What we got to say for eye hadn't seen and ear hadn't heard yet, you understand? It's not going to be a one sermon, go out there and take the enemy. If you want to see that, there's some dedication, some commitment, there's some understanding. There's some, I mean, don't go out there downcast and defeated because the devil's already got you if that's the case. David was excited. He said, I ain't going home. I'm getting to play in this game. You see, when you train, Brother Bill, you want to play, don't you? I'm not even going to go into that story. What made me want to play was watching Bill hit the softball. I'd never seen anybody do such damage. I was sure that it was going to come back uncovered and lopsided. I mean, you know, it's impressive to watch somebody that knows how to fight. It's impressive. It's impressive to when, when, when they stand their ground and they keep their distance and they just speak the word of God. And I remember walking into an atmosphere one time with Brother Jim Clark and, and him having a little 17-year-old girl who had never spoken a day in her life. You've heard me tell the story. I got three more minutes before y'all turn into pumpkins. And, and I walked into that room, and she'd never spoken a day in her life, didn't know who he was, didn't know who I was. We walked in that room, and in a man's voice, she looked, and she went, I know you, Jim Clark. 
I was one of the, Phil I was one of the Israel armies hiding in the hills back there. <laughs> and then she broke out and run. And Brother Jim said, go get her. I said, uh-huh. <laughs> she didn't say she knows me. See, I didn't know what kind of dominion authority I have. I'm learning that every day. Are you with me now? I get excited when I hear something that might give me an advantage in a battle. If it's even a headache, if it's even the smallest thing, if it's even ants filling your front yard up with ant beds. I can't make y'all laugh for nothing. Bow your heads. Father, we love you.